Okay, we're, let's kick off this thing here that we're doing the next month. This is called, as my wife mentioned, Heart for the House. So the house is this church here. And the heart that we're talking about, the heart is you guys. You guys are the heart that makes up the house. And over the next four weeks, this is a, a campaign where I'm asking that the hearts of this house uh, step into something and be obedient to something that God is calling us to. But before I do that, I've got to really brag about th- this church and especially brag about the people that are in this church. We've got some absolutely amazing people here. Uh, we're going to have some pictures come up on the screen there. Uh, I actually picked 52 of these pictures off of the Mother's Day shoot. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so th- this church is full of just amazing people. It's amazing, happy, wonderful people. I I could not ask for a better group of people. I couldn't ask for a better church. And before I talk about anything else today, I want to celebrate who you are and celebrate the people that make up this church, the hearts that make up this house. See, when my wife and I came into South Point Church, we came in as broken people. We, we were so low, we were alone, we didn't have friends, we didn't have family, we'd been trying to start a church uh, of our own for like three years, which just failed over and over and over again. And Miss Trudy invited us uh, to come to South Point Church, and we said no, or I said no, Casey said, yeah, I'll give it a shot, and they tricked me into coming, and we came during the week, and we watched Trudy do some kid's thing for La Gratitude. And then I was like, I'm ready to get out of here. We'd been burned. We'd been hurt. And, um, and the, the pastor before me, Pastor Morgan, did such an amazing job just kind of pulling me aside and saying, hey, how can we help you? And I told him, I said, we need, we need a family. We need a place to land. We need to be cared for, and we need some relationship." And that's exactly what South Point did. And we spent the next year just being loved on by this church, being loved on by you guys. And then when we were given the opportunity to take over uh, as lead pastors here at at South Point, it's just like kind of mind-boggling that that even presented itself. You know, we have a line that we say here all the time, that we are a church to call home and a family to call your own. And this line here, we've got it on our website, it's on our t-shirts, we say it every Sunday morning. I want you to know the origin of this, it's not some trendy statement that we sat down and we wrote, it's not something that I got from somebody else, this came out of my own emotions, my own heart, my own feelings for this church. When we came, we were looking for a home, we were looking for a family, we didn't have a family, And we actually, almost literally at the time, we were in the process of moving. We didn't even have uh, a home. And this church became that home. And this church that was a home became a family that we could call our own. I'll never forget that sense of family. The first time that we walked in and visited on a Sunday morning. We'd been to every church in Cape Town. We'd, We'd visited, met the pastors, all of that stuff. And we walked in here and I just watched our family get taken care of. I just watched them just be wrapped up and wrapped into the people and the life of this church here. And you guys really became a family. And this place really became uh, a home for us. See, some of you know this, but not everybody knows this. Part of my journey and my story is one of depression and, and anxiety and there was a time in my life uh, before, we, we became, before we even came to South Point where I spent about three years going through one of the lowest, kind of darkest places that I could be. Uh, I was born in a way that you know, there's two kinds of anxiety. Sometimes things are event-induced, and sometimes you're just born, you know, you don't, your brain doesn't make the chemicals that it should make. And, and that, that, that's me. I'm on that side. And I was really struggling with depression. And, and see, for me, statistically, to be quite honest with you, I should not even be here. Now, they, they say statistically, those that have been through uh, two major depressive breakdowns in a lifetime, the rate of suicide with those people is exceptionally, exceptionally high. And I, I went through five documented massive depressive breakdowns in a year and statistically I shouldn't be here my therapist at the time said there's there's no way 
Like you are one of the, I, I don't know how you're still here. I don't know how you're still alive. And I, I won't say that I didn't consider it many times, many, many times. And even came right up to the edge there. And so I, I quite literally shouldn't be. And I came into this church as somebody that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be here. And I was loved on by his family. And I was loved on by a church that would become our home. Even before we were pastors here, this church was home, and this was a family that we could call our own. And in the same way that, that I shouldn't be, when we took over this church, it was right after COVID, fun times, really fun, you know? <laughs> Learning how to pastor a church for the first time coming out of COVID, uh, and it was not easy. Uh, did you guys know that I didn't even, I'd only preached like one or two times before we took over here. I had to teach myself how to preach and how to communicate during COVID when no one was in the room. It was wild. I'd set up TVs around the room and pretend that they're people. And I talked to myself for like, you know, nine months until you, everyone came back into the into the building here. But it, the conversations that went on behind the scenes here was, are we going to make it? Is South Point going to pull through? Are people going to come back? And there were times where we thought, well, we're going to have to sell this building. We can't afford to keep it. Uh, we don't know if, if people are going to come back. I remember when we came back, I looked out one Sunday, and there was like 40 people in the room. And I had this overwhelming sense of, of I can't believe you guys came. This is amazing. I mean, I was just amazed that 40 people came. Then 40 became 60, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. But when I, I think back about, you know, this church, and even before me, before us, the history of this church, there's so many seasons that would tell you that this is the church that shouldn't be. And the church that shouldn't be, because if you look at it and you try and make sense of it, it's like, this, sh this church shouldn't be here. We shouldn't have uh, the people and the tithe that we have. This church just should not be. And a church that shouldn't be is led by pastors that quite literally shouldn't be. And I, as I was thinking about that and thinking about this heart for the house, I, I really wanted to kind of set the tone and, and explain how amazing that this house is. And so I, I, I jotted some things down, uh, put pen to paper, and I, I came up with this kind of saying here, that uh, we are the church that shouldn't be because none of what we have in our should be. And as I prayed over this statement here, I, God gave me some words and I kind of wrote this thing out and we put together a video about it. Uh, but it explains that we are the church that shouldn't be because none of what we are should be. So I, I want to cue a video here. Have you guys turn your attention to the screen? Hi, I'm Pastor Chris, and I shouldn't be, but it wasn't up to me. See, I found this church, or rather, it found me, and I started to understand that, like me, it shouldn't be. South Point Church is the church of the shouldn't be. We shouldn't be here. We shouldn't have survived COVID, and we shouldn't have kept this building. We shouldn't have kept and gave the people we have. We shouldn't have the eldest leaders and pastors that we have. We shouldn't have the groups and volunteers that we have. We shouldn't have seen the baptisms and salvation that we have. We shouldn't have seen the thousands of hours of ministry moments that we have. We shouldn't have paid off a million rand in debt and given a million rand care like we have. We are the church of the shouldn't be because none of what we have in art should be. We shouldn't have seen new people being added to the community. We shouldn't have the rainy day fund and nest egg and the financial stability. We shouldn't have witnessed the healing of bodies and relationships and renewed immunity. We shouldn't have seen the renewals of hopes and dreams of promises of peace and security. We shouldn't have seen strongholds torn down, people set free in a partnership with angels in unity. We are the church of shouldn't be, because none of what we have in ours should be. Now we stand in a new place, still a place we should not be. Culture, society, the world, the algorithm has already defined what should and should not be. But we've made a habit of finding ourselves in places we should not be. We should not be a church to go home and a family to hold your own. Because everybody else says that belonging isn't that easy anywhere else. We should not be a safe place for anyone, and I mean anyone, to have a safe encounter with Jesus. Because everyone else says there is a certain something and a certain someone you have to be or before you preach up and show up. We shouldn't be a church where those who don't know God and want to get to know God. That's absurd. But you see, the world gets love and absurdity confused. The world doesn't yet see it's not love or absurdity, but rather it's being absurdly love that should be. We are a church of the shouldn't be because none of what we have in our should be. Now we stand in a new place, this time a place that we should be. 
should come to expect that we are exactly where we are, positioned as we are for what we are and for who we are because we are never needed to be anything they said we should be. We should see the last come and be found. The safe should be renewed and resound with worship and praise for God because we never had to be. We should see the broken heel, the lame walk, their face be still in a love so grandly revealed. That God would give himself aiding in flesh the man, the only man who had anything to do. When God became man, the world received all that needed to be. Now we see why it's fair to be a church of shouldn't be. None of what we have and are should be. Church, it's because of this man that we are not done being what the world says we should not be. It is because of this man that I have a heart that will not stop beating. And as long as it beats, I will beat the walls of the strongholds that hold captive our communities. It is because of this man that these hearts that shouldn't be will imprint and be imprinted by this house this community that is South Point Church. And this heart for this house will make a new way for hearts and houses across our city. This year, we will not worry about what should and should not be, what makes sense, what is obtainable, what is reasonable. Because when we chase what makes sense, what's obtainable and reasonable, we don't even come close to what that man unreasonably laid his life down for. I say we start chasing what seems unreasonable, unobtainable, and insensible with our renewed and divinely appointed hearts for this house. If we run forward in faith with arms stretched out wide, we might find that a church that shouldn't be reflects a love that shouldn't be, miracles that shouldn't be, and a heart for a house that shouldn't be. We are a church that shouldn't be because none of what we have in our should be. And no, thank you. And that pretty much explains South Point Church, is that we are the church of the shouldn't be because none of what we have in our should be. There's nothing by my own might or my own power that says that I should be here on this stage or that I should even be leading this church. There's nothing by the might, the power, the, uh, you know, that, that we can explain about why this church still stands and why this church still is and why God is still even speaking to us and guiding us and bringing us into new seasons. It's just unexplainable. And I, I, don't, want, I don't want to start becoming explainable. I don't want to start what we do becoming explainable. Because I, I feel like that if I can explain it, then I bring it down into my own realm. You know, th there's a saying that I love, and that's, if your dreams are not impossible to you, then they're offensive to God. Because God is saying, dream something that's impossible. If there's any way that I can explain it, if there's any way that I can say, okay, here's how I manufactured it, here's how I grew it, here's how I ended up where I ended up, then I've taken part of it out of God's hands. I, I cannot explain how, uh, how a guy from East Tennessee would end up in South Africa, marry a woman from Texas who was also in South Africa, who had a child named Letha, and we would come together to be a family and then be called into church planting. And a guy who was never a pastor, who never preached, who never went to seminary, God would raise me up and raise this family up and move us to Cape Town. And then we would fail for three long years. I would defy statistics on even being alive. And God would bring us together with this church. And then a year later, we would have the opportunity to come in and lead you guys. That should not be. It just shouldn't be. A lot of you guys are here when you should not be here. It's unexplainable. But I don't want what we do to start becoming explainable. See, God's taking us into this new season, and God is asking us to do something that is unexplainable. So we want to continue in the trajectory that we're on right now. There's no reason why we should be. It's only because of who Jesus is that we are. And it's only because we keep Jesus in front of us that we are. And it's only because Jesus speaks and we obey that we are who we are. So you guys are in a really, uh, or actually I, I call this a position of terror for myself. So on one hand, um, you know, I, because I didn't go to sem, I think it's an advantage that I didn't go to seminary. Because it means that I studied the Word of God like like I just, you know, like there is just no, like I've got, there's no part of me that feels like, oh, I, I, I got this. Oh, I, I can understand this here. I am desperate for the word of God and I'm desperate to hear God. I don't come with a lot of strategy and things like that. I just come with an enormous amount of desperation. And I am terrified that there will be a part of me that will get in between 
what God wants to do and what God wants to say. So every single Sunday, I just make sure and empty me out. Written on the wall back here, I wrote it in blue permanent marker. Um, and I wrote on there, don't be a distraction, don't get in the way, just tell the story of the love of Jesus. And it's a reminder for me that I shouldn't be walking on this stage in front of you guys. We, we as a church shouldn't be, but we are. And God's calling us into something that continues to be unexplainable. And so out of obedience to what God is calling us to do, we step into this new season, this heart for the house. We ask that you who have hearts that make up this house, that you guys would be receptive to hearing this new season and you guys would be receptive to asking God what it means for you and what it means for us. And so in obedience to God, I've got to say you know, what I call throw up words, you know, where you say something and then it makes you want to uh, throw up. I, don't know. I remember the first time I told Casey I loved her. I said, I, I love you. And I was like, oh, I can't believe I said that out loud, you know. <laughs> yeah, she's not in here right now, so it's, it's fine. You know, our relationship started out. God told me this is the relationship that shouldn't be. You know, God told me, Chris, are you ready to get married? I said, yeah, God, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Cool. I was in northern Namibia sleeping in a tent. He said, go back to Nelsprit. Next day, got up, drove the 10 hours all the way to Nelsprit. I get there and I say, okay, God, I'm ready. God says, you're going to marry Casey. And I said, I don't even like Casey. <laughs> Why? That's true. That was true. We'd never been on a date. We'd never hugged. Never had anything, any connection. But God said, you're going to marry Casey. And in the same sort of throw-up terror, I went and sat in her house. We sat on opposite couches. And I looked at her. Leafa was running around half-naked. Had just had a bath. Casey's putting him to bed. And while she's putting him to bed, I'm sitting there thinking, God, if you could just come back right now. If you could just come back and take me. Uh, this would be just so good. She came out and sat down, and I just told her. I said, Casey, God said that you're the one I'm supposed to choose, and you're the woman I'm supposed to marry. And that relation, I was hoping that that would scare her away, and she'd be like, you psychopath, get out of my house here. <laughs> I wanted to throw up when I said that. And Casey looked at me, and she said, okay, I choose you too. You know, it was that obedience that I carried through scary throw-up words that the greatest blessing that I've ever experienced came into my life. Eight months after that business meeting, as she calls it. Yeah. Eight months later, we got married. You know, funny story here. I want to take a vote. Uh, who? Yeah, probably not. But as we were leaving that night, there was no kiss. There was no hug. I gave her a side hug. And I could see over her shoulder, I could see my Bucky, which is the one that my beloved one that took me to Namibia and Botswana. And I just wanted to be in that thing there, you know. <laughs> And she says, can you share an emotion with me? And I was like, okay, uh, I appreciate your time, <laughs> right? Who thinks appreciation's an emotion? Okay, there's no one, thank you. Well, he was scratching his face, didn't even count, you know? So I said, I appreciate your time. But, but it's through obedience, through the crazy, unexplainable, unexpected word of God, the greatest blessing that I have ever experienced came into my life. The greatest. September 15th, we've been married nine years. And that it came out of just stupid, blind obedience. And now as a church, we have an opportunity to step into stupid, blind, unexplainable, unexpected obedience. And I believe that the greatest blessing that we've experienced up to date is going to also come from that. So by the end of the month this month, I'll tell it to you the way I told Casey. By the end of the month this month, I want to pay off two and a half million rand in debt and become a debt-free church. That, that's the obedience. I just did my part. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's pay it off, you know. I mean, God, God, God said, Chris, pay it off. Pay off the debt. The elders, we came together as elders. God said, pay it off. God told them, pay it off. We're just going to be stupidly, blindly, unexplainably obedient. And the cool thing is, is that if we pay off this, this debt, this is primarily the, the bond in the building. 
is what this is. We don't really carry any other debt. Then that frees up 82,000 rand a month to reinvest back into ministry and into salaries and into programs and into all kinds of other things. Isn't that amazing? We pay off. What's bigger? Two is smaller than eight, right? So we pay off the little amount and we get the big amount. But it's crazy to think that, you know, okay, God is saying just be obedient here, Chris. So I'm putting it out to you guys. But look at, what, look at the blessing that comes off of it. The blessing that comes off of it is something that we reap month in and month out over and over and over and over again. You know, and, and for me, this is significant for us because it does open up some doors and some avenues for us. Like, for me, doing this and being obedient to this, and I had to go to God and say, okay, God, tell me why. And he's like, well, why? Because I told you so. Well, God, can you give me a little bit more to go on here? And he started to put a burden in my heart and conviction in my heart. It's kind of the way God speaks to me and he talks to me. Because I'm not, I'm not smart enough to sit down and strategize this thing. But I am desperate enough to own up to God that I, I can't figure this out. And I don't have this figured out. And so God, I just need you to talk. Do you know how much time I spend just staring at the ceiling? Just saying, God, please, something, anything. And so over time, some of this burden is developed. And part of it is that I want to prepare, uh, I want to prepare this church for the next generation. I don't want to give the next generation of leadership in this church a church that has a noose of debt around its neck. I, I don't. I want to hand over a debt-free church to the next generation. And I believe that if we hand over a debt-free church to the next generation, then it even gives us, we, we have more freedom then to dream and then to do. How cool would that be? Someone has a dream and they, they come and they tell the pastor about it. Hey, hey, pastor, I got this dream. I feel like God's really spoken to me about this. And then we're able to say, okay, great. Then now let's go do it. To dream and then to do. Instead of dreaming and coming forward and saying, that's an amazing idea, but we don't have the resources or the personnel or the people in order to do that. Keep dreaming, but we, we're not able to do that right now. I know that, like, no, come on, you don't need money to do anything. I promise you, you do need money to do some things. And right now, we, we, we are at capacity. And this is the second time that I've prayed, <clears throat> that I've prayed and asked God, uh, I told God years ago, I said, Lord, Trudy and I are the only employees here. And we're working 80 hours a week, 70 hours a week. You've either got to shrink us back or you've got to expand us. And then God called me into a time of fasting and I, I did that. And out of that time, God said, I'm going to expand you. And the tithe grew and the consistency grew. And we were able to, to hire and onboard two more staff members. One of them was Pastor Linton and Another one was an amazing young man that's gone on, and, and now we have Pastor Kyle out of that. And, and that, that came because God said, I'm going to expand you. Last year, came to the same place. God, you've either got to expand us, or you've got to tell me to hold. And God said, Chris, I'm going to expand you. It's time to expand again. And I said, okay, how? And he said, pay off the debt. And so we're going to be obedient in that. And that's going to give us the ability to dream and to do. You know, another thing that this will do is this will give compound blessings. You know, I, I, this, I, when he put this on my heart, I was thinking about like compound interest. You know, we, we have a retirement account and, it, you know, compound interest. It's like magic money, right? It's, it's amazing. And compound blessings, it's like magic blessings. You know, I, you can't outgive God and you can't outbless God and you can't outsacrifice Jesus and you can't outdo or outrun Jesus' pace of blessing you, Jesus' pace of loving you and caring for you. I don't know what that blessing will look like, but I know that God wants to give these compound blessings. And then this is something that I just wish for you guys, I hope for you guys, is if, can you imagine if we do this, that it would give you a miracle boost to your faith? I believe that not only could we boost our own faith through a miracle like paying off two and a half million rand of debt in a month, but I believe that we can boost the faith of churches that are around us, of people that are around us. I've already got pastors saying, hey, hey, crazy guy, tell me how that goes. Because they're saying, if it works, tell us what you did. And at the end of it, I won't be able to tell them what we did. 
I'm going to tell them what I've already told them. Hear from God, be obedient. Are you hearing from God? If so, then be obedient. And that brings me to God's kind of final word. This is why this is happening. This is, this is it here. And, it, and th- this goes back to the same reason why I had a conversation with Casey. Why I had that, that blind, unexplainable, stupid, just amount of faith. And stupid amount of determination. It was to do what God says and then see what He does. God told me, that's the woman for you to marry. And so we did. And now I see what God is doing through that and in my life. Casey's a big reason why I'm a statistic breaker. Because she's been a part of saving my life. Yeah, amen. Amen. Amen to that. And so now here we as a church, if God cares that much about me, one person, how much does God care about all of us and about all of those that are out there? He cares about them the same. And so we, we get an opportunity not to, not to really question it or doubt it, not to try and explain it, but to do what God says and then see what He does. Because I believe that more life-saving miracles are going to come out of something like this. You know, I, I wanted to try and relate this to you guys and let you guys know that we are not the first church that, that shouldn't be. We're, this isn't the first church that's come up and said, hey, you know, we're the church that shouldn't be because none of what we have in our uh, should be. You know, the idea is that God has provided everything, that God has done everything. And we're not the first ones that have done this. In fact, there was a, a church conference after about, I, I, I should have looked this up in between the services. It was either 20 or 40 years post-resurrection. I'm leaning more towards 40, so forgive me uh, about my research there. But the point is, is that there was a church conference And these people got together, and those that got together were there for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. They were there to see Him come out of the grave, and they were there to see Him ascend into heaven. And those people that were there that were a part of that, they made up what would kind of be the first post-resurrection church. And that church almost shouldn't be, shouldn't have been, many, many times over. There should have never been a church that would even come out of the movement of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus died on the cross, where did the disciples go? They went and they hid in a house. They weren't standing outside the tomb looking at their watch going, 10, 9, 8, 7. You know, they weren't doing that. There there wasn't ice cream cake in the backyard. There wasn't a, a party. There weren't people gathered. They were in a house. They were hiding Because Jesus was dead, and everything that he said had died with him. That's a church that shouldn't be. But the church is because there was a resurrection. Because of that resurrection is why we have the church. And the church continues to be because there was a great commission. Jesus told the disciples, go out and make disciples. Go out and baptize the nations in my name. See, that that helped to solidify the church that shouldn't be. Then if we fast forward, if we go about 40 years after that, we come to an incredibly, incredibly crucial point in the history of a church. Did you know, let me give you a little uh, fun information about churches. Did you know that I know church pastors that have had a church split over the color of their walls? It's crazy, you know? People have, have torn churches apart because... They argued over what music to sing or not to sing or how dark the room was or how not dark the room was or do we spend money on a TV or do we spend money on a cross or do we, you know, there's been these arguments that have happened and and silly things have split the church. And in this post-resurrection church that we're talking about 40 years after the resurrection of Jesus, they had something that came up that was not silly at all. They weren't talking about the color of the building or the carpet or how loud the worship was. I mean, you guys never talk about that stuff. It's, you know, other churches talk about those things. It wasn't about that stuff. It was about something that was deeply, deeply rooted in culture and and even in their own sort of interpreted theology there. You had two groups that were coming together. You had the, the Jews who after Jesus had resurrected, 
They said, not because of his teachings, not because of who he was, not because of what he did, not because of anything that Jesus did while he was alive. When they saw Jesus resurrect, they said, ah, maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he's right. And we call that group the Judaizers. And then there was this other group that had nothing to do with Jesus at all. They were the Gentiles. They were like the sinners of the world. They were worshiping false gods and idols They had all kinds of just sexual immorality and all kinds of stuff. They were sacrificing. uh, They were eating. They just, these were bad people. The Gentiles were lost. Jesus did not come for the Gentiles. He came for the Jews, not the Gentiles. The Gentiles can never be good enough to enter into the presence of God. And those two people had one thing in common. They saw the Messiah resurrect And they heard the stories of the Messiah's resurrection and His ascension into heaven. And they knew the stories of what had happened in Jesus' life. And that one thing in common brought those two starkly different groups together to try and become one church. Some of you guys can't get through a Sunday lunch as a family and be together and get through that. Here we have these two unbelievably different groups of people trying to come together. And when they come together, there is a clash. And there is something that they don't agree on. And it's in this moment, when they come up against this, that they become the church that shouldn't be. Because that church should not have made it. They should not have made it through what they were clashing with. Because it was things that were so... The Gentiles had this deeply rooted experience with Christ, this Deeply rooted experience with the Holy Spirit. They had no law, no religion, nothing. They just had this encounter with God that changed everything for them. And then the Jews on the other side, they had all of this, these laws and this kind of religion. And they had the teachings and they had the laws of Moses. And they, then they had the Messiah that they were saying, okay, this guy rose, so now maybe we believe in him. And what they did is they just added Jesus onto the laws and the teachings of Moses that they had. And so they said, okay, now he's good, so let's add him to this. And those two groups were going to come together and they clashed. And oh boy, did they clash. In fact, there was a bit of a a discussion, and it got to a point where they had to call the first church conference. We had a conference a week or so ago. I would like to believe that ours was more fun uh, than the one that we're going to talk about here. But let let me let you in. I want to bring you inside on this conference so that you can see how the early church, the first early church, is also the church of the shouldn't be. We get to carry on in that same tradition. So let's let's look here. We we come to Acts chapter 15. And we'll start here in verse 1. And uh, you've kind of got an idea of the characters here. So some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers. And this is the Judaizers, the Jewish people that came down. And they're in a place called Antioch, which is a Gentile city. And Paul and Barnabas had been in Antioch. There had been miracles that had happened. The Holy Spirit had fallen. These Gentiles had just experienced God in this huge, amazing way. Their lives had been utterly changed. And now these guys come down from Jerusalem, these Jews from Judea. And they say, hey, unless you're circumcised and in accordance with the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Can you imagine that? Essentially what they're saying is you have to have surgery to be saved. And, and men, it's a doozy. All right? It's a doozy. You've, that's what you've got to do in order to be saved. And, and th- that is that, that Jewish tradition, that Jewish law that, that, you had to be un- that you had to be circumcised. So they say, you've you got to be circumcised so that you can be saved. This is going to ruffle a few feathers here. And in verse 2, Paul, Paul and Barnabas, who'd been there you know, working with the Gentiles, they disagreed greatly, and they debated with them. So they determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others from their group would go up to Jerusalem, which is actually south on the map, would go to Jerusalem uh, to the apostles and to the elders and confer with them concerning the issue. So they said, we're going to call a meeting. We're going to go to the elders and we're going to call a meeting about this because we're too far apart here to make a decision together. We, We need some help here. And so Paul and Barnabas, they pack all their stuff and they put some fruit. What is it? Padkos? Padkos? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, they get all that packed up together, you know, some druivors, some biltong, and, 
you know, get all salted up for the journey. And they take off, and they've got some people that go with them. And so they, they get there. They get, they get to Jerusalem, and they, they gather the elders and everybody together. And, and as they do, as they're talking about this, they're kind of explaining what's been going on in Antioch. We see in, in verse 5 here, we see that some from the sect of the Pharisees who had believed in Jesus as the Messiah, those are the Judaizers, there they stand up. And they said that it's necessary to circumcise the Gentile converts to direct them to obey and observe the laws of Moses. So they've now put two conditions on salvation. Surgery and like 400 and something laws that they've got to keep and they've got to obey. And what they're doing is they're they're completely discrediting the unexplainable, unexpected, undeserved, shouldn't be miracle of salvation that came directly from Christ when, when he came and he fell on the Gentiles. The Jewish people are saying, okay, the Jesus stuff is great, but that goes on top of all of this that's here. But the apostles and the elders, we see, the apostles and the elders, they come together to consider the matter. After a long debate, I don't know how long it is, uh, Peter got up and he said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the message of the gospel and believe. So Peter's reminding them, guys, remember, the Gentiles, they heard it come from my mouth, and I'm one of you. And when it came from my mouth, they believed. So don't, please, don't forget the facts here. And in verse 8 it says, And God, and God who knows and understands the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, and here's the line here, just as he also did to us. So he's saying, like, we're not, we should not be divided like this. In the same way that you got the Spirit, so did, so did they. And then he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith in Jesus. And then in, in verse 8, he goes on to say, or in verse 10, Now then, why are you testing God? And he ends this, this talk here. He's talking about how the love of Jesus makes us free of the guilt of sin and grants us eternal life. They received it in just the same way as they did. And then James, the brother of Jesus, steps in. James was an expert on the law here. James steps in and he gives his two cents and he kind of explains uh, some things to him. And he says, okay, here's a compromise. And these two polar opposites, they made a decision there. Instead of being the church that shouldn't be, they said, no, let's, let's meet on this compromise. If they hadn't done that, it would have fractured the church, and who knows where we would be. And so, therefore, James says, that it is my judgment that we do not trouble and make it difficult for those who are turning to God among the Gentiles. Essentially, what they were saying, what James was saying, is that the church should not get in the way of people coming to Jesus. So that, that was unexpected. That was unexplainable. That's the church that shouldn't be. That's the church the Judaizers couldn't understand. That we should not get in the way of people coming to Jesus. And then they go and they deliver this message here in, in, in verse 28. Uh, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to place on you. So this is James, or uh, this is Paul and Barnabas and Peter talking to the Gentiles. And he says, we're not to place on you any greater burden than these essentials. And James gives them three rules here. He, he says that, I, don't want you to, I want you to abstain from sacrifices to idols, from consuming blood, and from, then also from eating the meat of things that have been strangled, and from sexual impurity. So basically he gives them two rules. He says, you're going to be around Jews, so don't eat, don't, don't eat offensive things to them. And then abstain from sexual impurity. And I, I'd like to think that the congregation that heard this, they were probably quite relieved. In fact, in Acts 15, uh, it goes on to say, once they hear this news, so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and after assembling the congregation, where all the men are tapping their feet like, we're still trying to figure out if... Could you imagine if we had like our first-time visitor class like that we call next, and we said, okay, guys... The one thing you got to do in order to join the church here. And it only applies to the guys. I don't think we'd have a lot of people coming back to the church, right? And so this congregation is assembled. All the guys are probably like tapping their feet, you know, telling their wives like, we may bail, okay? We may get out of here. 
And they delivered the letter to them, and when they had read it, the people rejoiced greatly at the encouragement and comfort that it brought them. See, the church made two decisions, and that these two decisions helped them to become the church that shouldn't be, which is the church that we continue to not be, because it was Jesus and Jesus alone that had to be. And the first decision that they made is they resisted the pull towards insiders and away from outsiders. We saw this when they got rid of the circumcision and when they, when they said, okay, we, we can't just listen to the Judaizers, let's listen to the Gentiles as well. When James said we should not be a distraction to those coming to, to the church, for those coming to Jesus. And then the second thing is they resisted the pull towards law and away from grace. You know, the law of circumcision, the law of, of Moses... The, the law of Moses, it creates a moral code, and that's good, and we should follow that. But that's not a prerequisite for salvation. So they, they had to answer two questions. And I, I believe that Jesus also had to answer these two questions. And Jesus had to ask God before he put himself on the cross. And this church had to ask this as they were deciding what kind of church they were going to be. But... These questions, Jesus says, what does love require of me? And then what, what exactly is at stake? See, so when Jesus looked at these two questions, he came up with the answer that we try and model, that we try and follow. And the answer to this is everything. See, Jesus gave everything, which is why we are the church that shouldn't be, why I'm the pastor that shouldn't be. Because Jesus already gave it all. And then our role now, because Jesus went before us and Jesus gave everything, our role now is to inspire those who don't follow Jesus to follow Jesus. Because Jesus is the best thing to follow. In fact, people never really had a problem with Jesus because those that were nothing like Jesus even liked Jesus. And so that, that brings us to this where we are now as a church, this heart for a house, we continue in the same trajectory of we are a church that shouldn't be. The church, like us, has been making decisions all the way back to the first iteration of it. We've been making decisions. And it is only because of God, because of Christ, and because of the obedience to that, that we are still here. It's amazing to think that this thing that we call church has survived all of that and brought us to this point right here. Isn't that crazy? That we sit here and we share this room because of a string of events that happened over 2,000 years ago. There's no way that we could orchestrate it, that we could write it, that it could be, that, that we could come up with this. We are the church that shouldn't be because everything that we are and have shouldn't be. It's only because of Jesus. That we are. And so when I think about this heart for the house, I'm asking us to continue to be the church that shouldn't be. I'm asking you to do one thing today. One thing and one thing only. I want you to ask God what you need to be stupidly, uh, unexplainably obedient to. That's what I'm asking. You know, you know the, the goal. The goal is to become debt free at the end of the month. Not in a year, not in six months, but just end of the month. Let's pay it off. Let's get rid of it. But what I need you to do is I need you to hear God. And I want you to ask God what it would cost you. And I want you to ask God what is the thing that you should just be stupidly, blindly, unexplainably, unexpectedly obedient to. And to do what God says and then watch what he does for us and for you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm just going to pray that over you guys as we go into a time of worship.